had a number of experiences that began what I call my awakening, but one in particular I'll never forget. A young African-American man, no more than probably 19 years of age, walked into my office, actually conference room, and forever changed my relationship to the criminal justice system. We were waging a major campaign against racial profiling in California. We called it the DWB campaign, the Driving While Black or Brown campaign. And at the time, I was directing the ACLU's Racial Justice Project in, in, in California. And we had put up billboards you know, that had hotline numbers for people to call. If they believed they had been stopped or targeted by the police on the basis of race, and we had received thousands of calls. In fact, within the first few minutes of the hotline's operation, our system crashed because the demand was so heavy. And we were interviewing potential plaintiffs. We had already sued the California Highway Patrol for race discrimination in their drug interdiction program, but we were looking to sue other law enforcement agencies as well for racial profiling. And so I was spending my day interviewing one young black man after another who had terrible, sometimes tragic stories of their encounters with the police. And this young man comes in carrying a stack of papers this thick. He had taken detailed notes of his encounters with the police over a nine month period of time. He had names, dates, witnesses, locations, often badge numbers of officers. There had been a crackdown in his neighborhood and he had been stopped repeatedly and searched, often tossed to the ground and brutalized in a nine month period of time and he had documented it. And I was, oh my gosh, usually people don't walk in with this kind of documentation. And he was smart, he was charismatic, he was engaging. I was talking to him thinking, this is our dream plaintiff. This is who we've been looking for. We have been preparing a suit against the Oakland Police Department and in walks our dream plaintiff. And then he said something that made me pause. He's, and I said, wait, did you say you have a felony? Did you say, did you say you have a felony? And he says, yeah, I, I have a drug felony. But listen, I, I was framed. The police set me up and they planted drugs on me and then they beat up my friend. And you know, it happened a couple years ago. He starts telling me this whole story about how he was framed by the police and you know, his friend was beat up. And I, I just shut down. I stopped listening. I just started apologizing. I'm just, I'm sorry, but we cannot represent you. We cannot represent you. If you, if you have a felony, the media will be all over us. Law enforcement will be arguing, of course we, we should be keeping our eye on him. You know, he's a drug felon. He's precisely the kind of guy we should be keeping an extra eye on and stopping and searching, you know, every chance we get. We'll be having an argument in media about your criminal history when we should be focusing on the kind of the police, I'm so sorry, but we can't, there's nothing I can do, we can't represent you. He keeps telling me about what had happened and I just keep apologizing, apologizing, and finally he becomes enraged. And he says, you're no better than the police. You're treating me just like them. The minute I tell you I'm a felon, you stop listening. What's to become of me? He says, I can't get a job. I can't get housing. I'm living in my grandmother's basement. I can't even get food stamps. I can't even feed myself, take care of myself as a man. What's to become of me? He's like, you're no better than them. You're just like the police. And he snatches those papers out of my hand. He's ripping them up, ripping them up. He says, good luck, go, go find a young black man in my neighborhood they haven't gotten to already. They, they've gotten to us already. Ripping the papers up, they go flying in the air. He turns around, takes off. Several months later, I'm in his neighborhood doing a public access television show because we're trying to organize thousands of people for a protest against then Governor Davis's refusal to sign racial profiling legislation in California. So we're doing this live public access television show and we've been holding town hall meetings up and down the state about racial profiling and people telling their stories and gaining momentum, the movement. And as soon as it ends, he comes bursting in carrying this dirty potted plant. He was bursting into the studio and he thrust it into my arms. And he says, I'm here to just say I'm sorry. I apologize. And he's emotional on the verge of tears. So I see you're out there 
trying to work hard, do the right thing for our people, and I shouldn't have treated you like that. I'm sorry. I'm just here to say I'm sorry. And he thrust this plan in my arms. And he turns around and starts running out the door. I chase after him. He runs away, jumps into this broke-down car, and disappears. Several months after that, I'm in my office, open up the newspaper. What's on the front page? The Oakland Rioters police scandal has broken. A gang of officers, otherwise known as a drug task force, had been planting drugs on people, beating suspects up, and who is identified as one of the lead officers guilty of having planted drugs on folks and beat folks up, but the officer he had identified to me as having planted drugs on him and beat up his friend. And it was that moment that the light bulb finally went on. And I said to myself, he's right about me. I am no better than the police. The minute he told me he was a felon, I stopped listening. I couldn't hear what he had to say, and I couldn't allow his story to be told. <coughs> and that was the beginning of me asking myself a lot of questions about myself as a civil rights lawyer and advocate, someone who thought they were working for racial justice. Started asking myself, how am I, in fact, perpetuating the very forms of discrimination and exclusion I'm supposedly fighting against? And I started asking myself, why is it that we haven't been able to find one young black man in his neighborhood that they haven't gotten to already? <laughs>